Hi, John. Hiya. How are you today? We're all good. Good. Um, so on Monday, I put up a question um, and asked the community to ask any questions they wanted to know about the Talking Miniatures book that's coming Oh, excellent. Recently. Right. Um, so I got uh, a few questions in, and I thought maybe we could, uh, you could answer them. I'll do my best. People. Okay. So the first one is by somebody with the name of Painting Nightmares on Instagram. And their question is, what memory gave you the hardiest chuckle? Oh, um, well, in the book, there's 17 chapters by 17 different people who were there at the front lines, if you like, in the 80s and 90s. So there's an awful lot of uh, rich pickings in there. But uh, paintbrush, nightmares, you, if you ask for the one that makes me laugh the most, it's how the Chaos Dwarves got their hats so big. Um, I think it's a story told by Rick and then corroborated by the Perry Twins. You might have to buy the book for that one, but it's most amusing and it's all true. Okay, uh, the next question is by Clive Stone. Uh, on, it was off of Facebook. And their question is, is it an audiobook? And if not, why not? Well, hi Clive, what a very good question. Um, uh, Robin has got some uh, very impressive recording equipment and so we did do um, most of the interviews face to face because of Covid some of them had to be done over the telephones and uh, over in inter internet and all that so the connections weren't quite so good. Just thought it would work better as a book, it was always going to be a book. Um, it doesn't mean that we couldn't take out sections for, and then put it out on audio as well. I think that's a really good idea and Robin and I have discussed it. At the time, we didn't say we'd be doing that with the uh, authors. We said it would be a, uh, all translated. Uh, uh, so we'd have to go back and get their permission, I think, if we wished to do some sort of audio log. But I think you've got some legs in that, and it's not a bad idea. All right. Um, the third question is from Rusty Shackelford. Uh, that was on Facebook as well. And their question is, when are we getting a follow-up? Crikey, we've only just released it two weeks ago. Uh, people. Well done, Rusty. Uh, well, it's good. Uh, uh, if um, Hopefully, Melissa is getting some feedback as well on, on, on the popularity of the book. It's gone well. Uh, it did take us nearly five years to get that book out. I know it sounds a long time. and we, we did have COVID in the time, which slowed it down a great deal. But we can only, at the moment, interview people who, who no longer work for Games Workshop. And there's still a few great guys and girls who would love to get their story from. But... Uh, because they're currently working with the company. Uh, the contracts don't allow them to discuss the company. Uh, doesn't mean that we're not going to do another, a third volume though. Uh, Robert and I are already penciling in what we might do. Um, so the fourth question is from Palmetto Wargamer on Instagram. And their question is, if you could change one thing in your career, what would it be? Golly, what a great question. Um, I wouldn't change a great deal. Uh, I suppose, yeah, if I'm honest, the only thing I would have done is I probably stayed on a little bit longer at Games Workshop than perhaps I might have wanted to. It's very difficult setting up your own company and it's quite frightening and very scary and all that. Uh, but uh, once it's done, it's done. Once you're in the water, it's lovely. But uh, I perhaps stayed a bit too long at Games Workshop. I should have perhaps struck out independently before. But I was very grateful for all my time there, don't get me wrong. So, yeah, go with your own destiny in the end. Um, okay, the fifth question is from Dana Little on Facebook, and uh, they ask, what was it like looking back on all of the accomplishments you and the others built over the decades? Did you ever think that you all would be the pioneers of so many people's hobbies and the industry itself? Wow, that's a good couple of questions in there. Uh, yeah, looking back to 1983, I think I joined. Games Workshop 82, 83, as a Callow X student, uh, and it seemed fairly dreamlike at the time because I was working suddenly in a hobby which I adored and didn't realise that you could work in the hobby if you really wanted to, and you can make it your dream. And it took me a while for my parents to accept that it was a proper job, of course, and I can see their point of view. In the book, in the book Talking Miniatures, it was the 17 various authors. I think they'd all say that uh, we weren't quite sure where we were going, but we had a great time going on that journey. But there was never an end point. Uh, and uh, uh, I think Games Workshop today has a better understanding of where it's going today than it probably had certainly 20 years ago. 
in those formative years. Yeah, after about 20 years, uh, I think we all got to realise that Games Workshop was something new and had longevity. Um, certainly 35 years ago, I wasn't sure it was going to last forever because uh, that didn't seem a plan. But uh, Games Workshop now, if you wanted to buy a Games Workshop, it cost you two and a half billion pounds, which is a fortune. Uh, and uh, they know where they're going. And, uh, uh, and the best of British luck to them. On the sixth and final question is from Leonardus Maglor on Facebook. And they asked, what is your favorite part of the book? My favorite chapter is the one written by Paul Robbins, Golden Demon winner, uh, who was factory manager in Eastwood back in the day. And it's a very charming uh, chapter where he, uh, I think, shows a very, very humble appreciation of all the fantastic workers we had in what uh, in a town that had taken a real big hit from the coal industry going down and how we got together a team of people to keep making all these wonderful miniatures and getting them out around the world and making it an international export uh, business. So that's my favourite chapter, and I didn't think it would be, but it was. Well, that's great. Any, any more questions on Talking Managers, please uh, uh, write in to me, talk to Melissa, and anything else about Warlord Games or anything else you'd like to ask. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, Robin. Hi, Melissa. How are you doing today? I'm really good. I've just had good. a fantastic ride over here on my oh, motorbike. Lovely. Nice day for it. Lovely Sounds day. Out. Lovely day. Thanks for coming down. It's a pleasure. Um, so, similar to what I did with John, we're going to ask you some questions from the community about your wonderful book, Talking Miniatures. Okay. And, um, yeah, you just give me your best answers. Okay, let's go for it. All right. First question um, is by Paintbrush Nightmares on Instagram. And it, they ask, what memory gave you the heartiest chuckle? Oh, that's a really difficult one, Paintbrush Nightmares. The heartiest chuckle. Uh, let me think for a minute. It was it was probably Andy Jones's retelling of the story of the great Dark Future live role play incident when the South Yorkshire Arm Response Unit surrounded a group of Games Workshop staff who were running around some woodland in Yorkshire with paintball guns and dressed in leather jackets and Dark Future plumes practicing a kind of live dark future role play. It's partly because Andy's a really good storyteller and he tells that story very well. And in fact, the other one that I actually burst out laughing on was Andy tells a story. I've, I'll give you two answers now. Perfect. The second story was, was again, it's an Andy Jones story because he's such a fantastic raconteur. And I was um, clutching my stitches where he said he, he'd not long been at Games Workshop and Diane Ansell, who's Brian Ansell's wife, Said to Andy, said Brian's going to want to talk to you, but it's uh, there's no more money and there's no company car, and and Andy went, oh yeah, sure, Diane. Yeah. Okay, there's no more money and no company. Don't ever mention that. Said, yeah, okay, okay, I got it, Diane. <laughs> she said, you know, for days I was going, no more money, no more company car, no more money, no company car, and eventually Diane said, can you come and see Brian and Keith now? So Andy went down the corridor and he walks in, he goes and sits down in the chair and says, hello Brian, and Brian says, Andy, you're doing really, really well. And he said, well, thank you, Brian, that's very kind of me. He said, so we're going to give you um, some more money and a company car. <laughs> <laughs> and he said it was like a shot from a Bond movie. I didn't know what to answer. If I answered yes, would the door open and the flat <laughs> trap door drop out and drop me into the shark pits? Or was I supposed to say yes? I kind of went, oh, thank you, Brian. That's very kind. <laughs> and there I was, a 22 or 23-year-old guy. But it's much better when Andy Jones tells it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, okay, on to the second question from Clive Stone. Uh, and this was asked on Facebook. And they would like to know, is it an audio book? And if not, why not? Um, hi Clive, um, it's not an audio book because I'm old and because I'm old I like books. I like books as things that you can hold and it's why um, the book is the way it is, why it's two volumes because if it was one volume it would just be uncomfortable to read, it's 500 pages plus, it would be a big chunky thing to put on your lap. So we split it into two volumes, put it in a classy slipcase and made it a thing of beauty and a thing to treasure. An audio book we have got the tapes. I have got the tapes. I'm keeping them in a vault of the original conversations that we had with Rick and Andy and all the rest of it. But to be honest, they're not usable in that format because they were conversations. And in conversation, you've got lots of ums and ahs and, uh, and people go off to the toilet and come back. It, they're not usable in that way. 
And so the job was taking those conversations and editing them and then presenting them in a way that that made coherent sense. I mean, believe you me, the original tapes are nowhere as coherent as they come across in the book. Okay, so question number three is by Rusty Shackelford, and that was this was asked on uh, Facebook as well. Uh, when are we getting a follow-up? Oh, hi, we're Rusty. Eager. Uh, we're eager for a follow-up. Well, this one um, took five years to research and write and edit and put together and produce. And that was in the pandemic. Um, would we like to do a follow-up? It really depends on how well this does. If this book does really well, and we, ha we expect it to do, and we hope it does, because I think it's a beautiful book. You know, I, I'm not kidding when I say, this is the book I wanted to read about that era, and nobody had produced it, and so we wrote it ourselves. Um, there were two who we were recently talking on the Warlord Open Day. We were here in this room with Alessio and John and, and Jervis and Andy, Andy Chambers. Rick was here as well. And actually, Alessio said, you should do another book called um, Talking Miniatures, The Second Generation. So we get Alessio Cavatori and Thomas Pyrrhonin and The Second Generation. There are also people that we'd have loved to have talked to for the first book, but we couldn't because they're still working for Games Workshop. And if they're working for Games Workshop, they were bound by confidentiality. So John Blanche and Jess Goodwin and Ali Morrison. There's a whole list of people that we would talk to. Whether there's a, where there's a Talking Miniatures Volume 3 really depends on how this does. If it does well, it's a possibility. If this is just a one-off, then that's great too, because it's a beautiful one-off. Perfect. All right, fourth question is by Palmetto Wargamer on Instagram, and they would like to know, if you could change one thing in your career, what would it be? Oh, I'm going to have to think about that. It's, bit, it's, it's a bit of my career that I didn't talk about at the time. Uh, because uh, my career was joining Games Workshop was just the most exciting ride for a 32 or 33 year old and then becoming White Dwarf editor was just fantastic. I loved every minute and then getting to actually manage the studio and actually make sure that all of these wonderful creative people were working that kind of way. After I moved on the studio I went and led um, what was a joint venture between um, game, uh, Games Workshop and a computer games developer to produce a very early version of an online Warhammer game. And actually it became a mess and it became a mess because the developer weren't able to do what they said they'd done and Games Workshop were funding this and it just became, it just became a very, very painful mess. And it ran for three years and then eventually we just looked at it and certainly Tom Kirby looked at it and said, and the developer said, oh, we want some more money now. We've got this far, but we need more money. And Tom said, no, no, no more, no more money. You spent three and a half or four million pounds. No more money. The fact that I didn't get fired at that point, <laughs> having sprayed three or four million pounds up a wall for no result, I think is a credit to the integrity of the team that I was working with and how honest we're being about where we thought the failures. It was a bit of a mess, but let me say something else when about uh, your career. That was a period that I kind of, I don't regret it. I'm sad that it happened in the way it did, and particularly when people lost their jobs at the end of it, but boy, did I learn some stuff. That's... Boy, did I learn some stuff out of that. And I've applied that stuff ever since question is from Dana Little on Facebook. It's a two-parter. We're going to start with the first part. Let's do part one. Yeah. What was it like looking back on all of the accomplishments you and the others built over the decades? Well, that's a really fascinating, fascinating question because you don't see it like that at the time. At the time, you're doing a job and you go into work on Monday and you've got what's on my desk here, what's got to be done today, what's got to be done this week, what's got to be done this month, and you just get on with stuff. And so, you know, when I was editing White Dwarf, uh, we had 30 days, less, 21 days to produce an 80-page magazine. You know, that was, that was it, because three weeks to produce it, a week at repro and print and distribution, it's in the shops, and then you're doing the next one. So you just don't have time to think about accomplishments at that point, because you're young and you're hungry and you're just doing stuff. And that, this kind of looking back doesn't happen. Looking back, of course, you kind of go, wow, that was an amazing time. That was just an amazing time. But when you're in the middle of it, you're just doing it. Nobody's got you know, that, that opportunity to kind of reflect at that. You know, one of my big regrets about the book is that there are so few photographs. 
There are just no photographs of the early studio of Enfield Chambers. Why is that? Well, because photographs were at the time, you went to Boots and you bought a little camera and you had a film loaded and you took it on holiday and you took pictures. Nobody had a camera, nobody had a phone with a camera in it. I mean, it's just, you didn't do that. You didn't go to work and take photographs of your mates. That would be absurd. And so there are no photographs. I mean, there's, there's stuff there, but we were just doing stuff and we were just doing the best we could with what we had at the time. And it was just exciting. And with hindsight, it feels bigger than that. But at the time, that's what we were doing. Uh, second part to Dana's question is, did you ever think that you all would be pioneers of so many people's hobbies and the industry itself, which you've sort of answered already, but... Kind of, no, well, the answer's no. Mm. No, we were just doing stuff and we were just doing the best we can we could at the time with the resources that we had. And yes, it was exciting. And yeah, in, in kind of ways we knew that this was new, that people hadn't made miniatures like this. And it's not just the design studio where I was. You know, John talks very much about um, developing the retail chain. Nobody in the UK, in fact, nobody globally had ever run a chain of retail stores selling goblins. I mean, it just seems completely absurd. But the innovations they put in, in-store gaming tables, because, you know, retail analyst, an analysts would say, oh, you've got to maximize your shelf space and maximize your retail. You don't need these tables. You go, no, we've got to teach people how to paint and how to play games. That's what's cool about this. And so the stores as hobby centers, where people went to hang out and play games and meet like-minded people. That's an innovation and all, all of that stuff. So no, we had no sense that we were being pioneers. We knew that it was cool. We knew it was exciting and we trusted each other. Um, sixth and final question <laughs> is from Leonardus uh, Maglor. Wow. Uh, on Facebook. And they would like to know, what is your favorite part of the book? Oh, Leonardus, that's an almost impossible question. What's my favorite part of the book? Uh, there were different kinds of fun. <laughs> Let me say there were different kinds of fun. It was one kind of fun, actually uh, editing and, and doing the words, because that was very familiar to me. I did that for a lot, a lot of time at Games Workshop. Um, I really liked going back out there and researching the images and trawling through old white dwarfs and I had so many happy memories of kind of looking through this issue and going, oh God, I remember that, I just, look at that, I remember doing that back then and all of this stuff came back. I mean, th we are talking over 30 years ago now that this stuff was done and I just, for me, there's something really humbling. Um, both on Facebook, you know, I'm a member of a number of Facebook groups, including White Dwarf Through the Years and Old Hammer groups. That these people are still really passionate about issues of White Dwarf that I produced 30 years ago. And they really still like them. And that there's a longevity to what I was doing, because at the time we just thought it's monthly magazine, chuck it out the door, on to the next one, on to the next one. But we were doing something of quality. So I think for me, the whole book was a journey back into the past and going, Actually, this stuff was built to last, even though we didn't know it. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> That's a pleasure. That was fun. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to the communities? Yeah. People, keep, people keep saying to me, how well is it selling? And there's a bit of me goes, I don't care, because this was a real labor of love. This was, was just we, say a labor we, we, we did this because it was the right thing to do, because John and I were sitting in his garden, ruminating about the passing of time like old geezers do, and we just went, somebody should write this stuff down before we start to forget it. And we've already lost people. We've lost people already, people like Wayne England and, 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 and lots of other people who are around. And we just, it was the right thing to do. And actually what we want to do is do a beautiful book that people treasure. Why no audiobook and why no Kindle edition? Kindle edition, for goodness sake. It's a book that you hold and has pages that you turn and, and, it's, and you want it on your shelf. And actually it's designed to fit alongside Rogue Trader and Warhammer and all that. It fits, you know, it, it's part of that canon. And we wanted a beautiful thing. And that if it's a beautiful thing that people love, then our job is done. And if we sell some and make some money, then what we're going to do with it? We're going to think of another project to do with the money. Um, but actually, I just want people to love it and enjoy it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Okay. We're done.